like to talk to you a little bit. Everything okay? That way? Okay. It's okay? So maybe we can get started again and get into the second session. And Eric Abert will talk about what thermodynamics can teach us about economy. Yes, thank you very much. So, no break, sorry. Um, so, I'm, I'm Eric Herbert. I'm working in Lille, in Paris. And we'll talk about thermodynamics. And I want to first thank, of course, the organizers to invite me. So, this work was done in collaboration with IFT uh, and with some economics. And uh, so, the team is composed of one part of uh, economics and one part of uh, physicists. The talk will be in two parts. Uh, first, a general historical presentation, something very brief of thermodynamics paradigm in economy. And uh, in the second part, I will propose um, uh, a modeling which is based on uh, thermodynamics uh, formalism and which take into account energy and matter, quality and quantity, and which depend of the, the on time, which means it depends on friction. Um, so at first, what what is the link between economics and mechanics? At first, if we recall Valras at the very beginning of uh, 20th century, the formalism the formalism was based on celestial mechanics, so it was not thermodynamics at all. And then, uh, using uh, Gibbs formulation, we had with Sodi and then Samuelson use of thermodynamics uh, in the sense of equilibrium thermodynamics, so thermostatic, which not convinced Samuelson all of this slide because at the end of this slide in, in, the, in the 60s, he was not agree with himself because he considered that first law and second law of thermodynamics should not hold in economic systems. Finally, some uh, some out of equilibrium thermodynamics was uh, developed also, and I will say a few words about this, uh, essentially with Schumpeter and Rogen. Okay, so I will point out now just uh, a few uh, thermodynamic stuff, uh, which is thermostatic, in fact, and which is based on the uh, Callens approach. And this discussion is uh, about the um, mainstream economy, which use uh, an object which is called general equilibrium and which is based on exactly this formalism. The first thing is uh, we can always, in a thermostatic system, uh, develop what, what is called an hypersurface, <coughs> and which shows Okay, my m emails, no. <laughs> okay, which shows uh, if we, if we uh, represent it using extensive variables, 
and a third of the three so the third dimension the entropy which shows uh, the function which should be uh, optimized which is entropy so equilibrium appear in that kind of representation as a convex surface and we uh, just look at the location in which the, the, the entropy re reach its maximum value. So, looking for the equilibrium, the local equilibrium in the Kalen approach just means that we look for the convex uh, part of the uh, hypersurface. So, the general structure of thermodynamics uh, here is adapted from uh, another paper, not from me. So, if we consider Lagrangian, and I don't have a stick. Yes, I have. So here, if we have a Lagrangian, we have a function which is extensive, which is uh, the the first term of the of the second part, and which has to be uh, optimized and compared to the Lagrangian multiplier here. So what we are looking for is something which looks like an equilibrium. So we have intensive variables which has to be. Uh, um equivalent at, uh, at, that, uh, at that time. And uh, thermostatic structure is based on this, uh, on this approach. So if we apply this in the pure thermostatic uh, uh, formalism, then the function that we want to optimize is, of course, the entropy. The xi variable, which all are extensive, are, for example, internal energy, volume, uh, matter, and what we want to uh, to observe is the uh, path that the system can uh, can can follow if we add some constraints and we want to see what is equilibrium which is obtained when there is no gradient at all of any intensive potential and then we have got the p is equal to 0 so of course if we describe this uh, system using an entropy uh, an entropy formulation, then the intensive parameter will be written here. So the derivative, the first derivative of entropy compared to an, uh, internal energy will be the inverse of temperature, and etc. We have pressure of a temperature and a chemical potential over temperature. So using this, we can derive the Euler fundamental equation. But at now, we have made only half of the work because we need to be completed the equation of states. What are the equation of states? It's the description of all the intensive variables here. So as an example, I put here the perfect for the perfect monatomic gaze, we have 1 over t, p over t, and mu over t, which can be obtained using the uh, Gibbs-Duhaime formulation. Okay, And once we have all of this, then the system is totally described, and we can uh, determine all of these states. Now, if we can... Uh, can I have some if we want to describe it from an economical, from an econo economics point of view, we have to replace the entropy function, with the, which is extensive, by another function, which we want to be uh, optimized. Here, it will be the utility, x e, which also be, which also be, um, which also is, extensive, is the purchase good, and the price density here are the roles of uh, marginal utilities. And what we are looking for, finally, is equilibrium. And the equilibrium is obtained also when the uh, gradient of p is 0. So of course, once we have written this, we can derive the Euler fundamental equation using exactly the same formulation as before. Thank you. But as before, we need uh, we have done only one half of the work. We need the second part, and the second part is the definition of the uh, state equation. So the question is, does have uh, the marginal utilities the same role and, in fact, the same statue of 1 over t, p over t, and mu over t? What does that mean? It means that the system must be ergodic. We can observe some er emergent properties, and it, de depends, it does not depend on time. We can say another way, which, which is based on thermoelastic coefficient. So we can define thermoelastic coefficient, which are defined by first derivative of the uh, extensive uh, function uh, entropy. And uh, this thermoelastic coefficient has to be uh, 
uh, very smooth. So the, the shape of the thermoelastic coefficient must not be uh, too too uh, too uh, too hard. There is no. It, it will always be uh, uh, can be a derivative without a phase change. And if the phase state equations are known, so does the fundamental equation. And then we have a system which is, which is fully integrable, which means that we know everything about the system, which means that we know everything about the economic system from the past to the future. So I, of course, uh, there is a problem. And the problem is, if we define that kind of things, it means that we have an economic, an economic material. So we have an object, which is like a fluid, and which is economics. So it's a very, very strong assumption. And in fact, it's experimentally impossible to verify it. Uh, I do. Can you define a macro state? Micro state? The equivalent of a macro state? This is the point. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, maybe we should uh, remove this from the <laughs> recording. <coughs> <coughs> so, of course, we cannot define this um, this um, uh, this um, macro state, and we cannot define equation of state for all the eco economic. But we can discuss the local optimization, and we can discuss the local distribution of an extensive variable using the formalism that comes from uh, statical statical statistical physics. So, I have an example C from Yakovenko. And uh, Yakovenko says that the total quantity of money M is an extensive value, which is conservative, and can be distrib distributed over a certain number of agents. So finally, it's the same thing as uh, the quantity of energy in a closed system that should be distributed over uh, a certain number of particles. And what happened... Is it's a good question. Uh, for me, it's true. It's, it's, tr it's not f good. It's, uh, it's false. It has to be uh, out of equilibrium, of course. Uh, okay, so if we have a closed system in, uh, in a physical statistic and we have energy inside, which is an extensive and conservative value, you can distribute all the energy of on all the, the, the particles, which are the agents here. And what you obtain is a distribution of money f in all the agents, which is uh, which has a form which is very famous, which is the boltzmann gibbs distribution, distribution, and which is in fact exponential. Okay, so for now we do not have say a lot of things, but if we compare this distribution to the uh, to the wealth distribution in a particular case of United Kingdom, what we observe is this with two distributions which are very well separated here so we have a log log uh, uh, figure so we have two distributions which one th the first one here which is exponential and the second one which looks like a power law which is a Pareto law so using this tool we can say that in United Kingdom in uh, 1996 we have the population which is distributed in two parts the first part which are the uh, something like 80% which exchange uh, money with an equitable uh, trade and some happy few which are totally uh, outside the range and which in which for which the the, uh, the exchange of money is completely different so this approach is totally correct and i don't have nothing to say uh, to say about this but my problem is if we define the quantity of the mean quantity of money we can have the temptation to say, okay, this quantity is also temperature because it's exactly the same formalism. And once you have the temperature, you, are, you want to construct the entropy because it's the associated extensive parameter. And once you have the entropy and the temperature, you say, okay, if I have the entropy, I can construct the in internal energy, I can construct uh, and all, those, all those things, and in fact, I construct the thermostatic again. Okay, so conclusion about thermostatics. Um, economics does not have the structure of thermodynamics because we cannot extract an equation uh, of state. 
we do not have general optimization. We have locally, it's okay, but not generalized. There is no fundamental equation, no variational principle. There is, of course, no ergo ergodicity. There is no, to my knowledge, emerging property as temperature or pressure are. There is no hypersurface of utilities, so that kind of thing where we can find a, a, a local equilibrium just not exist. And of course, economic systems are not in equilibrium. But it, this is still the, the, main, uh, the main part of the formalis of the uh, mainstream uh, economics. So, just a very few words about uh, not at equilibrium. I found two, uh, two, two references which are uh, largely cited. The first one is Schumpeter, who says that uh, finally uh, ec economics is evolving because there are a uh, uh, succession of disruptive and uh, interaction with uh, innovation, which, um, which always put the economic system into uh, out of equilibrium uh, situation. And the second, uh, the second approach is, of course, Rogan, that uh, I think everybody knows here, and that introduces the notion of quality uh, into matters, and that says that all that the, the, the things that you can obtain from the mind is not the same things that you uh, that you have into your object. So you have a lot of purification, a lot of things to do, even if the atom is the same, the copper is the same. You can have in the mind, you can have it into your computer, but of course you have a lot of work, a lot of energy in between. Okay, the problem with Rogan is. Uh, he defined a fourth law of thermodynamics, which is not a good idea, and uh, which is supposed to describe the, the spreading of matters uh, the same way that uh, energy is spreading. But of course, matter spread, of course, it spread, but it spread because it, it has some energy. Matters without energy does not, no, does, not have, does not have any reason to spread, so there is no reason to have a fourth, uh, uh, fourth law of thermodynamics. And the second thing is, for uh, a strange reason, uh, something I do not understand, Rogan uh, stayed stuck on um, thermostatic uh, formalism. He was aware about the work of Prigogine, because um, I discussed about people that, that knew him. He was aware about this, but he refused to, to use this tool, and he were completely stuck into a thermostatic system, so of course, um, he opened largely a big door, but uh, he did not enter the, the house. Okay, so now the second part. So this part I want to propose, uh, I wish to propose an, alterati an, an alternative route to an ecological modeling. Uh, so I, I want to build on the thermodynamic categories, but not on uh, thermodynamic uh, formalism. And uh, we will build uh, physical cells that take into account the uh, quantity of primary resource, the intensity, that means the time in which you, you have to, to do some work, the quality and the quantity, and the inclusion of natural and forced recycling. So we plan to we plan to obtain uh, a com global economic system so this physical cell has to be uh, connected to a classical economic framework and we have we have chosen the goodwin which is a prey predator uh, dynamic system so how to so we give up totally the full thermodynamic paradi paradigm. So we do not need the in global integrability, we do not need equation of state, but we conserve um, a kind of first law, which is conservative law. There is no full substitability. Sub uh, there is non-conservation of some physical quantities, so it's a term of quality. And we have a clear difference between extensive and intensive physical quantities. Okay, so intensive physical quantities are the potential from which we can derive forces. I will go back on this. And uh, there is no economic entropy. We do not call it like this, but there is a quality which is uh, introduced. So we have, uh, at the first glance, we have a, s a global, uh, glo glo global view here. We have different physical cells that discuss the each resource, so we can have 
uh, an arbitrary number of cells. We can discuss about energy of different type of energy of uh, or uh, uh, one minerals of different minerals. We can discuss about, about a lot of things. A lot of things and all of these cells are connected to a demand function, and they give or they get cannot give a quantity uh, of uh, mineral of on energy that is cascaded by the, by the demand function. The physical cells are connected into uh, the Goodwin framework using this uh, twofold uh, model. It allows to conserve completely separated the physical part and the economical part. So how it works? We are basing our work on energy convention engine. So what we have here, uh, we have a source with is which is a high potential and a sink which is a low potential. So what, so what happens naturally is you have a flux of something here. Okay? If you have an engine in here, then you can obtain some work because you can transform energy. Of course, this transformation is never 100% uh, efficient, so you have always a flux to the sink. And <coughs> because we are, uh, we are um, uh, aggregating some, uh, some finite values, uh, then the sink can be, the potential of the sink can increase and then uh, collapse the difference of potential between the source and the sink. Here, the engine that produces work does not see directly the potential of the source and the sink. There are some uh, uh, resistance, access resistance, in order to access to the to the source. <coughs> so this can this allows to discuss the flow and stock economies, as as was uh, discussed just just before me. Um, and thermodynamic constraints on economy are input avail availability. It means that if we do not have any source here, if, if the, the quantity of the source here goes to zero, then the potential also, and we cannot obtain work. The same way, but the other side, the, si the potential of the sink can, uh, can increase, and then the difference of potential decreases again, and we cannot obtain work again and we are depending on the working intensity. So this is uh, a way to consider economic system as a living organi organism which metabolizes energy and matter. So here is a typical uh, efficiency versus uh, power uh, results that we can obtain from uh, that kind of engine. What we can have at the right part, which is the Carnot, Carnot point here, is uh, uh, the maximum work we can uh, obtain from uh, that kind of machine, but it's obtained after an infinite time, so the power is zero. And if we have a real machine, which is uh, which is with uh, um, friction inside, then we have this typical shape in the form of uh, a drop, which is shown here. So if we increase the working intensity, so we are working a little bit faster, then we are increasing both efficiency and power. Then we will obtain the first point here, which is a maximum of efficiency. And if we increase again the, the working intensity, we obtain the maximum power, which are two points clearly separated. So we with the way we can imagine it, if, if, we, if you want to obtain some orange juice and you have only one orange, then you will uh, optimize it in the sense that you don't want waste because you have only one orange. So we we'll take the time in order to extract all the orange juice. If you have the number of uh, orange that you have, the, the number that you want, the number of orange that you want, then you don't really care about waste and you will just take the, the easiest part of the orange juice that can be extracted. Okay? So you have different, uh, different results depending on the working intensity. And this is the way we are depending on time. Okay, so this is a global scheme of uh, resource economy. So we can recognize, in fact, two parts. We have the production part and the recycling part. The recycling part is divided in the natural part, which is, in fact, uh, the, the thing we can uh, see to the nature. And we have here the, the forced recycling, which is determined by the uh, activity of human, uh, by, by human and economics, and we have here the production, which is defined by a friction here, and we, we are producing some goods because we are 
<coughs> we are um, into two different potentials. If we are producing too much goods, then we have a storage here that we can use, and then the goods are going back into the use, and otherwise, it is uh, injected into the, the economy. The goods are in injected into the economy. Uh, so the lifetime of goods are exactly zero, because once they are used, they are always go to the sink. So here are the equations, so just quickly, we have the quantity, the total quantity, which is of course qu uh, conserved, so this is the quantity, quantity the high potential, plus the quantity in the low potential, which is <coughs> uh, conserved if we consider the, the part which is stored. Of course, uh, the, in the working intensity here is modulated using uh, a prefactor, which uh, helps to have different cells which are working at different working intensity. The flux here are defined by the local uh, potential. So here is the high flux, which comes from here. Here is the lower flux with a squared term here, which represents the part which goes to the, to the west, which is due to the friction. Okay, same thing for the recycling zone. We have a working intensity which is uh, which can be modulated using the, this prefactor here, and the flux that is leaving or entering into the system are defined di directly by the uh, potential at the same side. So here it's a potential from the higher side, from the higher potential, and here from the lower one. And again, we have the uh, the equivalent of the Joule uh, effect into this uh, this uh, this modeling, which is uh, the quadratic in terms of uh, intensity, which goes entirely to the waste. So some case studies. Uh, so how it works? We ask to produce some goods to the to the cell, and we see which what uh, what working point should be sh chosen in order to satisfy this demand. D'accord? <laughs> I hope so. So, here we have the quantity of goods which are produced. Here is the intensity, so the working, so, so working points. And we observe <coughs> that we have the quantity of, um, of goods that, of course, uh, increase over the intensity until it reaches a maximum here, which is a maximum production, which corresponds uh, to the, to the to the to the second point I show you uh, with the figure as uh, efficiency versus uh, versus power, and correlated to this production we have a waste flow that we always want to minimize. So of course, if we want to produce that quantity of goods, we have two solutions, and we will choose the one that produces the less quantity of waste. So intensity impact. What happened? Now, if we are working at specific intensity, chosen in order to show something. Okay, so if we have the maximum intensity, so we are working at the, the only value for which there is only one solution of the production. What happens here? We, we are looking for the pot we are looking the potential uh, in function of time, and what happens is the potential are increasing ve uh, sorry are decreasing very fast, and we we can see that the high potential decrease, the low potential uh, increase, so the difference of potential here is pinched, so we cannot produce a lot anymore. Okay. If you have an optimal intensity that corresponds to the exact demand, what happens is not exactly the same story, but we have the potential, the pinching of the potential, which is uh, a little bit uh, slower, but we still have the same uh, value of difference of potential at the end. We can now choose to produce 20% of the optimal in intensity. Okay. We can now choose to, to have 20% of the optimal intensity, so we cannot produce the quantity of goods that we need, but in that case, the difference of potential stays uh, large and we can always produce. So this can be seen also here. <coughs> So we have here uh, the production and satisfied demand. So here is a weak intensity. So as we can see, we produce never 
uh, as much as the demand, but we, we, we never stop to produce. If we compare with the maximum intensities, and we have uh, uh, a dramatic collapse of the, of the production, and, uh, and uh, we cannot produce anymore very quickly. In fact, what happened in that case is we fill the buffer because we are producing too much, and once the buffer is full, and uh, the difference of potential does not permit to, uh, to, um, to reintroduce and to produce any more goods, then we are using this, this, uh, this, uh, this storage in order to, to, to get back the goods. What happens if we modify the friction? So we have two cases here, low friction, high friction. So the, the exact value is not really important. What is important is we have a four order of magnitude between uh, the two of them. And if we compare the potential evolution um, over time, what we observe is uh, if we have uh, a very low friction, then the potential collapse uh, immediately and we cannot produce nothing anymore. And in fact, if we have a low, a high friction, which means a poor production system, then the difference of potential is conserved and we can still produce. So here is the same story. We have we have here exactly the demand when we have a low friction and then a collapse of the production, so we cannot produce nothing anymore. But if in the case of a high friction, so uh, so um, a, a bad uh, bad economic system, then we produce never what we are demanding, but we produce forever. Okay, now uh, we have maybe a little bit to accelerate. So. <laughs> So, so physical cell. So I get back into this uh, connection between the physical cell, and physical cell, and the Godwin framework. S so how it works? Uh, we choose to have only one resource to to parallel this case study. So we do not have a lot of uh, cells. We have only one. We start from an initial demand, and this initial demand compose the uh, demand function. Once we have this demand function, we are looking into the physical sex, to the physical cell, if it is possible to produce this demand. If it's possible, then we produce it. If it's not, then we are reducing the production. And we are doing this by modulating E into uh, the balance equation. So we have, I don't know, it's not maybe uh, too much important, so yeah, okay. So the the economical pre, uh, the economical uh, the economic sorry uh, framework is here. So you don't have to be very um, focused on the equation. But what is important here, we are using a prey predator model, and we are discussing uh, wage. In fact, wage and wage share. We have labor and employment rate, capital and investment and prices. So we have the uh, typical uh, quantities that are observed to economical ec to economic systems and we are uh, showing it here different production scenario in order to see what are the consequences of the finite quantity of uh, resource so the two first are in fact business as usual the first one is a good win without any uh, connection to a resource cell the second one is in fact should be the same as the first one because we have a quantity which is huge and then we are discussing three typical uh, states. We have a standard example, which uh, does not need any comment, I think. Here we forced to, to have no forced re recycling. So there is only the natural recycling. And here is a system with a high friction. And I keep the color code. OK, so what can we see here? We have the output, which is the quantity of goods which is produced over time. And we have in black and in blue, the same curve are completely uh, are exactly the same. What we can see is uh, finally the good win system is exactly the same as uh, our system with infinite resources. So working with a good win system is in fact the same thing as say that we have infinite uh, resources into the, into the earth. OK. Um, what I can say, in the case of, half of high friction, we have 
we have the output which follows the demand up to the to the maximum value it can it can uh, it can reach, and then some oscillation which depends of the connection with the economic system and. In case of the finite, finite resource, which is uh, green, we can see that the output, the demand is always satisfied up to the point that it's not possible anymore and we have a dramatic collapse of the production. If we are looking about, if we are uh, looking the investment, what happened here is uh, we always have the same uh, typical uh, shape for the G and um, infinite resources case. And what is important here is if we do not have investment, then the system degrades because there is a natural degradation of the, of the capital and of the uh, friction into the system. So we need investment. So for example, if in that case, where there is no forced recycling, <coughs> we are not able to, uh, to, uh, to have some any uh, investment. So the system will decrease. And in fact, it's, a, it's a the death of the, of the economical system. So what about the prices? So here the prices are something interesting because we can see that here in the case of high friction, we have the prices that grows a little bit. And why they are growing a little bit? Because we are leaving the, the demand uh, more and more. So because we are leaving the demand, then the, the, the discrepancy between the demand and the, the, uh, the production increase and the prices uh, increase also. In that case here, because the production just collapsed in a, in a, in a very, very, uh, sh with a very sharp uh, slope, then the price in cry increase also very quickly. Okay, if we are looking at the potentials, we have here, of course, uh, in the case of infinite resources, the potentials are constant. And if we are looking for uh, fi finite resources, uh, the potential decrease, so far, uh, finite resource is a, is, a, is, a, is a green one. We have the potential that decrease because we have production collapse and then increase again here because it's synchronized with demand. If we look at uh, here, we can see that the collapse appear here, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is was uh, random, and here the demand is decreasing. So because the demand is decreasing, then the potential can increase again. OK, for number three, see if there is no forced recycling. It means that we have a rapid exhaustion of, um, of the resource. So the potentials follow the, the, the quantity. And we have the potential that collapse. And it's followed by a slow increase. This is due to the friction because we are not able to have uh, to to, uh, to to have investment. So the resistivity, the friction into the system increase, and because the the uh, resistivity and the friction increase, and the difference of potential can increase also because we are not producing anymore. If we look at the recycling fluxes. Uh, what can I say? Okay, so in the case of uh, infini infi infinite resources, we do not have re forced recycling because the potential stay very low and the forced recycling is depending on the, on the value of this potential. So it stay very, s uh, very low. Um, we have here a strong increase in both cases here for standard example and high friction. There's a large increase here of the, um, of the uh, recycling and we have diversions here. <coughs> this is caused by the collapse of the uh, production, which is caused by the difference of potential, which, uh, which is very low. And once the differential potential is exactly zero, then we cannot have uh, recycling anymore and we have uh, simultaneously a collapse of the, of the, uh, of the uh, recycling. Okay, finally, yes, finally, uh, if we are looking for production friction, that, that means the, the, the 
capacity of the system to to let the energy or the resource the resource flow into the engine uh, the, the convention engine then we have in fact uh, three cases we have the infinite uh, resources which are these two cases we can see that the friction is decreasing with time because we can always have investment but we can see that here at high friction we always have also a decreasing of this uh, friction because in case of high friction of course we have a high friction so it uh, it starts uh, at a higher value but because we can have always a production we always have an investment and we are always able to to um, to decrease the um, the, uh, the, in the um, internal uh, friction. Okay, these two, these two scenario, we have a standard example, and if and without forced recycling, what happened here is we can follow exactly the same trend as the infinite resource as soon as uh, and as soon as the um, the uh, the potential collapse, then we are not able to invest anymore and if we are not able to invest anymore then the friction start to increase okay okay so this is the conclusion um, for the second part so energy and matters are slightly taken into account in most economic model in general and we are trying to work on this we propose an ecological modeling uh, who is composed of uh, thermodynamic co categories, that means quality, quantity, which is based on the physical size uh, completely separated from the economic parts. Into, si into this physical size, we, we are depending on time, which means we are depending on working intensity. We are depending on friction, that means that if we are one unit of production, it's not the same thing as if we are two units of production. Um, and we are connecti connected to a Goodwin prey predator uh, economic modeling uh, through a stock flow consistent model, which just says that we have uh, something which is um, um, conserved. Okay, we regain some reasonable behavior of finite size system with a collapse and etc. And now the next step is, of course, the calibration on uh, real economical data. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suppose there are some questions. <laughs> let me let me begin right here. Uh, <coughs> I don't think I really understand friction, but I was thinking as you were talking about some work that I knew about at Yasa back in the 1980s, um, particularly Brian Arthur and <coughs> some Russians, or Molyev, I think is one of them. <laughs> and it was on on returns to scale and ba I think it's true that with the Euler um, theory you have no returns to scale and that's the normal assumption in o economics but Brian Arthur and these other guys which scale are you talking about hmm? which scale which scale size I suppose yeah yeah I understand but uh, we are lo we are <coughs> returns <coughs> to scale Ah, OK. <laughs> OK. Merci. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so returns to scale are present here. You wrote a book. I'm not quite finished. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and it um, was introduced by Kenneth Arthur, uh, Ken Arrow. And, um, I, I, and it, the point is that once you don't insist on constant returns to scale, you can begin to explain all sorts of of economic phenomena, including mainly clustering kinds of, of phenomena, and of course what you see today in with these um, these uh, what do you call them De network systems, all of these violate the standard assumption mm. of zero returns to scale, but they they are now dominating what what we see in economic th growth theory and so on. Yeah, in fact, friction is a very important. <coughs> uh, is that is that related to friction? I, I didn't understand friction. Sorry. I say, is this related to oh. friction? Yeah, it is, it is friction. friction. It is friction. It is friction. <coughs> it is friction. Thank you. <laughs> that w this is worth discussing further. Okay. Uh, 
I would I would like to look at this power efficiency uh, uh, again. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Um, you devising here uh, this new machine here, um, which and, and you show that this is uh, dif differs from the Kano uh, process. But uh, actually, the counter process is usually the ideal machine, mm -hmm. which uh, you start from. But you never know; you know it. You never realize that. So you have very many different machines you really are working with, with well, the steam engine, or you have the the diesel motor, or you have all these different things. So they all, of course, differ, and you need additional models. So. Uh, I don't know whether I understand it right that you take now the the predator model to explain this in more detail, the deviations from this ideal process. Uh, in fact, we have a very few parameters uh, that uh, drive the shape here, and um, we, c we, we are interested, in fact, in the distance between maximum power and maximum uh, efficiency. We are interested in the surface of this, uh, of this, uh, of this curve, but what what machine, what engine exactly is not really uh, something we are, we are looking on. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Yeah. The engine itself has kind of efficiency. Yes. It's just the input and output. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. We are using this, uh, this one. Here it's just for an example to say where is the Carnot machine. I mean the Carnot machine is here, just here. But w this, uh, this, uh, this engine describes <coughs> this approach. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to get back to this, but can you give us a concrete example of what is friction uh, in the economy? Is this uh, efficiency of the production system or something? No. If Imagine you have um, something like this, so it's a difference of potential, okay? If you want to increase the efficiency or you want to decrease yields, you what you can do is to have a second one here. So what does that mean is you have one workshop, you add a second one. So you decrease by a factor of two the resistivity. And the concrete example in the economy? Well, it is a concrete example. <laughs> no, but uh, actually... Uh, you, you, you have only one workshop, you build a second one. Okay. No? So you can manage uh, the twice the, the same quantity of resources. Yeah, if you decrease friction, then what ha will happen is you will increase the flow into the system. So you have to work a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? It looks like the idea of re of trying to of modeling the the economy using engines or machines or or those sort of ideas that's been around for a while, yeah. And people have been playing with it. How do you how would it look? No. no. Oh, it's a new thing. Oh yeah. It's okay. A Has anybody tried actually more thinking along the lines of feedback control theory instead, where <laughs> where it's it's not the actual heat pressure. Yeah. It, this is a plan. It's the relationships <laughs> yeah. and cycles that matter. Yeah, yeah. we could do this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. If there are no other questions before the break, we have an announcement, and Thank I probably you. should bring the microphone back. <laughs> yes. <laughs>